which art in Sydney, good O be thy name. Thy bridge be done, if not in thirty, then in thirty-one. Forgive us our swell-headedness, as we forgive those cows in Melbourne who trespass against us, for ours is the harbour, the bridge, and the Bradman, for ever and ever. Amen. So ran an anonymous poem from 1930, two years before the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Sydney siders have a, a long history of being cocky about our bridge, and rightly so. It is difficult to admire the beauty of Sydney Harbour without thinking back to what it must have looked like before settlement by the Europeans. The indigenous Eora people of the various clans surrounding the bays and inlets were not as nomadic as those of the interior because the harbour and nearby bushland were bountiful, almost idyllic. Although not used often these days, Port Jackson was the go-to for colonial description for the waters of Sydney Harbour, Middle Harbour, North Harbour and the Lane Cove and Parramatta Rivers. It was James Cook who named the inlet after Sir George Jackson, one of the Lord Commissioners of the British Admiralty. As the Endeavour sailed past the entrance at Sydney Heads, Cook wrote in his journal, At noon we were about two or three miles from land and abreast of a bay or harbour within there appeared to be a safe anchorage for which I called Port Jackson. On the arrival of the First Fleet in 1788, the overriding thought was of survival and how to establish the prison colony. The necessity of a safe harbour, fresh water and deep port were considerable factors and Sydney offered all three. Over the first 50 years of settlement, the harbour became a vital link with England and the implementation of the transportation system. Ships were continually arriving with convicts, government authorities, new settlers and supplies. French, Dutch and American ships also docked in the harbour. Small ships were also sailing up to Parramatta and out through the heads and up and down the coast to service new settlements. For some years, Port Jackson was also known colloquially as Botany Bay. There are no broadside ballads where convicts are transported to Sydney or Port Jackson. Their destination was always Botany Bay. It was only natural the generous and beautiful harbour would become synonymous with Sydney. The Sydney Gazette of 8th of September in 1832 attributes one John Jones arriving on the ship Porcupine. You may think as you like, you may say what you may. There is no bay on earth like our Botany Bay. Captain Cook in his journal, possibly in a fit of fantasy recorded, if we could drain all this water away from the bays and creeks of Port Jackson, or better still, if we could tilt or bump up this part of Australia a couple of thousand feet, what a magnificent series of valleys with precipitous and wall-like sides we should have. There would be nothing like it in the world. So many aspects of colonial life confound us today. Bathing, for example, was a necessity and our colonial ancestors took to regular cleansing at the eastern shoreline of what became the Domain. A weekly immersion and scrub became a colonial ritual. People of the time were not natural swimmers and the fear of sharks and other sea creatures was a major concern. In 1825, the first of many bathing enclosures was constructed on the site of what we now know as the Andrew Boyd Charlton Centre. An abandoned hulk, the Ben Bolt, formed the southern boundary and rough wooden pickets marked the extent of the enclosure. A second ship, the Cornwallis, which had been a convict transport, was added later and it provided dressing sheds and served to segregate the male and female bathers. From then on, numerous bathing enclosures were constructed in the harbour, including separate men's and women's baths at Rushcutters Bay, where in 1906 the operator, Mr Farmer, shocked Sydney by introducing dual bathing. 
in the evenings, except Sundays. Sydney Harbour is dotted with large and small islands, including Clark, Cockatoo, Goat, Shark, Port Denison, and probably the most famous, Garden Island, now home to the Sydney base of the Australian Navy. Each island tells its own curious tale. Fort Denison, the native name of which was Matiwa, was simply called Rock Island, and later Pinchgut, for in early times, prisoners were sometimes punished with short rations. They referred to it as Pinchgut. In 1853, during the governorship of Sir William Denison, it became a defence facility. Garden Island was once a real island. It was joined with the Potts Point Northern Peninsula in 1945 to allow for the Captain Cook graving dock. The Aboriginal people called the island Buri Rong. It was here the crew of the First Fleet Sirius rested. The crew had to maintain a vegetable garden and that's where the island's name originated. Over the years, visiting ships docked for rest and recuperation. Before being handed to the Navy in 1865, it was regularly used by Sydney siders as a picnic destination. Shark Island is another island with a picturesque view. Its Aboriginal name was Boambili, and it became known as Shark Island because its outline vaguely resembled a shark. Oh, and it did have a famous shark attack when, in 1877, a well-known cricketer, George Coulthard, was fishing in his boat and a shark jumped him. Fortunately, he escaped safely to the island. Shark Island was where the very first Sydney to Hobart yacht race departed in 1945. The winning yacht, Rani, completed the race in six days, 14 minutes and 22 seconds. In 2017, Comanche smashed all records, completing the course in one day, 9 minutes and 15 seconds. In Sydney's early days, goats were a pesky problem. Someone had the bright idea of introducing them to the island the indigenous people called Maymay. Soon, there were so many the island became known as Goat Island. From 1831, hard-case convicts were sent to the island quarries for hard labour, excavating granite. Cockatoo Island, Warima, is the largest harbour island and has the most colourful past. Convict prison, colonial dockyard, Bilolia Industrial Institution for Naughty Girls and the Vernon Training Ship for Wayward Boys. The island is alive with history. Sydney loves its distinctive yellow and green ferries, and our harbour ferries have a history. A Jamaican convict arriving in 1801, William Blue, known as Billy Blue, was the first commercial operator to provide a harbour crossing transport service, initially taking passengers in a rowboat from Dawes Point to the northern spot which now bears his name, Blue's Point. In the 1840s, steam ferries revolutionised shipping around Sydney Harbour, especially the longer journeys up and down the coast, where rough weather had left many sailing ships wrecked. Some barely made it past the heads. Steam-powered ferries commenced in Port Jackson in 1842, and for the next 50 years, local shipping was controlled by several small companies. By 1900, Sydney Ferries had progressively taken the lead and claimed to be the largest ferry operator by fleet size and patronage in the world. Take me up the harbour on the Sunday afternoon Around the time of Federation in 1901, Australia's population pendulum swung in favour of the cities. Thousands moved to Sydney for new work in manufacturing and commerce. This heralded a major social change. Instead of a seven-day week on the farm, people found themselves with a five-and-a-half-day week. Leisure time was redefined, and the harbour became a favourite destination for water sports and the new fashions of swimming, surfing and boating. Travelling by ferries, Sydney siders picnicked in their favourite locations like Cremorne, Manly and Clifton Gardens. 
As our population grew, Sydney Harbour intensified as a working harbour. Piermont, Darling Harbour, Woolloomooloo and Millers Point housed warehouses, factories and docks. Tankers, tugs and dredges silently sailed to and fro and ferries zipped back and forth carrying city workers. In the heady days of steam, one group of regulars formed a hot potato club. When they boarded the ferry, they each put a potato in the ferry's engine room stove and collected it when they reached their destination. For many, the words Sydney Harbour evoke images of a sky bursting with colourful fireworks. Fireworks have brightened the Sydney Harbour skies since the first recorded display in 1804 when they exploded to the tune of Rule Britannia and God Save the King to celebrate the birthday of His Majesty King George III. It seems Sydney siders don't need too much encouragement to light fireworks and they have exploded right down through the city's history, including the arrival and departure of colonial governments, Federation Day in 1901, the 50th anniversary of V-Day, the Bicentenary, and of course, we light crackers every New Year's Eve. If Paris is the city of lights, Sydney is definitely the city of fireworks. <laughs> In 1908, we showed our loyalty to the United States of America when we welcomed Uncle Sam's Great White Fleet to Sydney Harbour. Essentially a show of naval muscle by America, the fleet consisted of 16 battleships and their escorts. They stayed for eight days as part of their global itinerary. The two most dominant man-made features of Port Jackson are undoubtedly the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House both acknowledged as architectural triumphs. Neither landmark had smooth sailing in their formative years. The bridge, at the time the longest single-span bridge in the world, was a year late, its official opening in 1932, a fiasco, and for decades, toll-paying Sydney siders reckoned they would never, ever pay it off. It was, in fact, fully paid for by 1988. Built at the height of the Great Depression, the bridge provided work for thousands and was regarded as Sydney's iron lung because it kept so many in work during those lean and mean times. Today, it is universally referred to as the coat hanger. The Sydney Opera House, opened in 1973, defines modern Sydney. Its elegant sails and central position on Benelong Point have made it one of the most recognisable landmarks in the world, a modern wonder and the ideal harbour backdrop for the Emerald City. Sydney Harbour of the 21st century is still beautiful. Awareness of pollution has made the waters cleaner, the distinctive yellow and green ferries still run, it's still a working harbour, Picnic spots are plentiful and peaceful, and the Harbour Foreshore heritage still shines and salutes our shared maritime past. Yes, we're still quite cocky about our harbour. <laughs>